the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea to sky from the rivers to the mountain tops we hear Christ be magnified Start at the top. Here we go. The creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. From north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ!
And we are in the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. And this is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, such a person as the Antichrist, the one who is denying the Father and the Son. And there are many ways that it can happen. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, and this is what I want you to do in light of all of that, in light of that, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father, and this is what He promised us, eternal life. And I'm writing you these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. And as for you, the anointed one you received, some translations say the Holy Spirit, and I think that would be a better transla uh, translation. The anointing you received from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you but as his holy spirit teaches you about all things and as that anointing is real not counterfeit just as he has taught you remain in him and now dear children continue in him so that when he appears we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming and if you know that he is righteous you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him sounds like a big mouthful so I'm going to pray before we go any further. So, Father, this is my prayer that by the power of your Spirit you would assist me in making very clear the centrality and the glory of your Son, Jesus. And that is really all that I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to start in verse 24. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, in the things that you know, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And the reason that John says this is because he has a really big concern that is happening. He's concerned about uh, the people that he loves deeply, those that are following Jesus, those that name Jesus as their Lord, that they're being intimidated and they're being confused by a group of people that John calls deceivers, liars, uh, false prophets, the Antichrist, and whatever else they are, there are a lot of them that are around them at that time. There are many of them. And that starts to add to the confusion that these people that he loves, they're struggling with. And the thing is, is it's coming, this confusion is coming from many different directions. These deniers, these deceivers, these false prophets, and they don't all look evil. If they looked evil, we would know. They're evil, let's go the other direction. But because we would know that there's something obviously wrong with them. But since there are many of them, it's not always easy to spot them. John is trying to give them some help because they look just like you and me, have a tough time knowing who is right, who is wrong. These deceivers and liars, because they're doing two things, and they do it in a variety of ways. The first thing that they're doing is in verse 26. It says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Other translation uh, says, deceive you. They're trying to deceive you. Second of, secondly, it's in verse 22. It says, it is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. And more than just denying that Jesus is the Christ, what it is they're denying is that Jesus is central, the Son of God. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Sometimes when they deny Jesus, it's going to be very blatant. 
Many years ago, there was an artist uh, that turned a lot of people's heads. He was popular in the media for a while, uh, Marilyn Manson. Many people are like, well, he even looks like this guy. He's the Antichrist. You know, he's this musician and his songs and his music. They were just kind of this hatred and this anger against Jesus, uh, you know, attacking God. I didn't really enjoy his music. I never really got into it very much. But I'm not really worried about him. He's not really going to lead people astray. He's not going to lead me astray. He's not going to cause people to stumble because it's not really the kind of guy that, well, you know, that most people are going to be listening when he's screaming about how much he hates God, well, it's easy for me to stay away from that. I'm like, why would I put myself in a position where I'm going to let that influence me? That doesn't. That didn't touch me. That didn't really hit my realm. Sometimes it's really obvious when people are against God. But what's scary for me and relative to believers is when it becomes very subtle. When these kind of alternative Christs sometimes get wrapped up in looking like the American dream. Because the Antichrist doesn't always mean against Christ. It can also mean alternative to Christ. The American dream is an alternative to Christ. And we've dealt with that a lot over the last few weeks, so we're not really diving into that today. In verse 15 it says, Do not love the world or anything of the world. Or, or anything in this, as we learned, kind of the world's system whether that's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when we buy into that world system, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, basically we're serving an alternative Christ. When John makes reference to the Antichrist, he's not talking about the Antichrist, you know, some end times person. He's talking about anything that is going to diminish the authenticity and the centrality of Christ as being God in the flesh, Lord of all, including Lord of my life. Anything that's going to take away and detract from that is what he's talking about. Anything that's going to pull Jesus away from being as the most important thing in my life, that is the anti or against Christ. Anything that hinders the life of God inside working in my heart and in your heart and in your life, that is what he's talking about. And sometimes that antichrist alternative life spirit shows up in church and that's exactly what is happening to the people that john is writing to kind of some of these influences have come into the church the letter that john is writing the book of first john the letter of first john it was not being written to one specific church or one group of people see the the book of uh the letter to the romans that was written to a church in rome uh, there was a letter to the Ephesians which was written to the people who lived in the city of Ephesus. This letter was written to several groups of believers who were scattered throughout Asia Minor and they were meeting in different house churches in different places. Many of them, uh, when they came to know Jesus and they started to follow purely honestly uh, from their heart, they started uh, learning. They had learned the, and, and been taught about Jesus through the teaching and through just a relationship with John himself. Which is why John says over and over, he says, my dearly beloved, my children, you are my children. I feel such a strong connection to you. Because many of them were literally his close friends and his dearly beloved children as he saw them in, in the faith. And many of you may remember that they were known as uh, just simple believers. And these people, they had this authentic faith. They loved Jesus, and that's all they really knew. And, and, and they had known that love from Jesus from the very first day, from the beginning of their journey with him. And they just had a confidence, a pure, strong confidence. You know what? Jesus is my Savior. I love him. I, I, I know that. And he was their Savior and Master. He's their teacher and their friend. And that is all that they needed to know in their journey as a Christian. They lived in the truth of Jesus, and they walked the way that Jesus walked. That's all they knew. That's all they needed to know. And then we get to verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, now, even now, many Antichrists have come. And this is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. When John uses the word and the term here, children, there are two Greek words for that word. And one word, it does refer to offspring. And it doesn't mean that I'm a, I'm a kid, because I will, 
I could be 51 years old, which I am, but I will always be my mom's kid. I'm, I'm always her little boy. And my mom, you know, I could be 81 years old, but I will always and I will still be my mom's child forever, her child. We are referred to as the children of God. We are the offspring of God, and that is what we are. That is uh, the word. John uses this word in the context of this letter many times throughout it, but there's another word for the word children. And John uses it also throughout, and it's a Greek word that has a reference to age. And the age that it refers to is anywhere from about a five to seven year old. They're the they're children that are still in need of instruction, they're in need of guidance, and they need help. So when John calls them my dear children, he's not calling them with that with a Greek word. He's not referring to uh, the offspring of God, though they are. He's, talking, he's not talking about them as being men or women or mothers and fathers strong and growing in their, their faith alive inside of them, that their faith is deeply rooted in God. And while simple childlike faith is very precious and it's endearing and wonderful, and it's, it's also marked by danger. And the danger is this. While simple child, uh, children, childlike faith, is pure and heart-connecting to God, there is a danger to being a child. Because the same openness of spirit that allows you to respond so wonderfully to the truth, to have an openness of spirit responsive to God, if it's not seasoned and rooted deeply in the reality of who Christ is and the depth of His Word, the same openness that we have to the truth, it can lead you to error or deception. A parent's worst nightmare. You already know where I'm going. A four to seven year old may innocently, because of their open spirit to anyone, walk right into danger. And I mean, are they walking into danger because they're rebellious, because they're just bad kids? No. You know, they may not have a rebellious bone in their body yet. They, they just wander away because it's curiosity or, or innocence. And at the same time, that makes them open. The, thing, the things that make them open to God would be the same things that make them open to danger. So, I, I, you know, the picture you have that, that you, you kind of run with when your mind starts to go into nightmare mode is a big shiny car, nice man. He's got some candy and he's like, hey, little boy, little girl. How about you get in the car with me? And that person is not your friend. But, but why does that kid go? It's, is it because of rebellion? Are they angry? Are they mad? No, they're just a kid. The same spirit that makes them open to a parent's love also makes them open to a stranger's deception. And if you have kids, you work your hardest to try and protect them and to teach them and to warn them. And I had that very experience when I was a six-year-old. I was walking home from school, and a car pulled up, invited me into the car. He said, I know your dad, and I'm about to go have a meeting with him. How about you get in the car? He would give me a ride to my house. I did not know this man. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know right and wrong at that time. I was just a kid. I actually got in the car. And he did, thankfully, drive me home. I'd never met him before. And he met with my dad. And I have no memory of anything else happening, thankfully. I don't, I don't believe I have a repressed memory. But to this day, I am, it brings up so much embarrassment and fear and shame that when I think about it, it still sends a shiver up my spine at what could have happened to me on that day. Was I being rebellious? I mean, was I angry? Was I trying to disobey? No, I, I, just, I just didn't know what to do, and I got pulled along into a situation that I did not know how to have boundaries up towards. At some point, you have to tell your kids, there are some things that, that are bad in this world, and you start to pop their bubble of innocence. But here's what you need to know, dear precious children. Not everyone is safe. You can't get into everyone's car. Not everyone is going to tell you the truth. And I love your open spirit and your heart to everything, but you have to learn to close your spirit to some things because there are deceivers. And this is dad talk to kids that need to grow up is what this letter is. There are many deceivers. There are many liars. You can't afford to be naive about this any longer. So who are the deceivers? And, and John has referred to them as liars and deniers and false teachers the Antichrist. 
John doesn't seem to enjoy them very much or trust them at all. And we learned about them uh, a few weeks ago because they were actually Christians. They were people that had bowed their knee to Jesus. And there were many different groups of them. And they had different theologies, different ideas, different philosophies. And they had different titles to who they were as a group. But as a whole, they were kind of called the separatists because that's what they did. They separated themselves from everyone else. These false teachers were in the church, and they called themselves Christians, but they separated themselves from other believers, and they were also known as the knowers because they separated themselves primarily because of the things that they knew. And what people think they, 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 they know is often the cause of a lot of separation that we still have in the body of Christ in the church system today. And you might have started your journey with God by where, when you first came to Jesus, you just had a love, a love for God. And it was just sweet. And you just love God with your heart and you, you, you began with that. And then, you, and then at some point you may have found a teaching about Christ that was really, man, for whatever reason, it gets me excited. I love to study it. I want to know more about it. And, 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 And you start to go after it. And and the more you learn about it, the more important it gets. Well, this seems to be such an important, vital uh, thing that I've learned about God that I I really, everyone else should know about this. And and, and it's so important that that other people now know what it is that you're learning. I want to share this because it's it's revelatory. It's amazing. And it could be a teaching in Christianity. Or maybe it could be an experience that you had with God where... I had this experience with God, and it was so powerful. It was so transformative. You need to have it too. And, and I really want you to have it because it's such a good thing, and it, it really is a good thing. That's the hard part. It, it, really, is, it really is a good thing. And, and, and it might be an experience that no one else has had, and, and, and it can be an authentic, legitimate experience where God met you one-on-one powerfully. And that insight that you have, it's really a good insight, and it's a really good teaching. It's a great teaching, but but it's not just that you feel good about the experience or that information and and that it really grows you in the heart. And and part of of what you really like is that, I mean, I, I love that I had that experience, and I love that I learned that teaching. But part of what I really like about it, and I, and I don't know that I would ever admit this to anyone, but, 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 it, but here's the truth, and I'll just be real. I have it, and they don't. I learned about this, and other people don't know about this. I experienced this thing about God that was so life-transforming, and I know other people don't have it, and God loved me so much, <laughs> maybe more than others. Or maybe it's because my life is better or healthier or less sin, and maybe, maybe, maybe that's why I got it. And, and, and I got this experience, they didn't. I got this knowledge, and they didn't, and that feels good. And that starts to tap into the pride of life. And before you know it, as you start to talk with others, you start to believe that you're living this way, is, is that I know something that they don't. <laughs> huh. And, and it's not just that about Jesus anymore. Now it's some nuance of theology or scripture in the Bible or an experience that you had with God. And some kind of, of Jesus truth that you latched onto. I know something you don't, so I'm in and you're out until you can do it. And you, maybe you're not as committed as I am. You don't have the insight or the perspective on you know, the, this particular scripture that I have. So I, I, I just think that maybe you're off because you're not embracing all that God wants for you. And you may not uh, even... Uh, You may not be uh, in the orthodox boundary. Sometimes we even leave that. Or you might be a heretic, and and you're saying that to someone who doesn't have the same perspective on some sort of theology that you have. But but as you're espousing and you've got these ideas and these thoughts, the, the reality is maybe they're also bending their knee to Jesus, and they love Jesus from their heart, and so do you. But, but because you have latched on to something else, now you start to separate over that. Well, they don't believe how I believe. I probably shouldn't worship with them. And that happens all the time. Malcolm Smith has a story that is uh, it's really actually a typical story. He grew up in a church that was thriving. 
there was a certain group that after several years got very excited as they were studying through the book of Revelation. And it's a wonderful book of the Bible. It, there's so much good in that book. Uh, and they got enamored and taken up with the study of eschatology, the study kind of of the end times, what's going to happen at the end of the, the world. And, and this church, they began to develop and place a very strong belief that there would be a seven-year tribulation and then the millennium after that. And that's fine. That's within the boundary of accepted theology and understanding and Christian belief. There was nothing wrong with that. But what they thought they knew about the end of the world very subtly but very quickly became that became the most important thing in that church and the vast majority of the people in that church they loved jesus but the thing that you needed now was to hang that you had to hang on to to be a part of this church was that particular belief but there was a problem and, and that was well there was a smaller group off to the side in the church well we didn't really we don't really believe that view that it's seven years and then the tribulation you know we we, we think it's only going to be three and a half years and that started to create quite a stir and some arguments and some fighting in the church. And over time, those with a dominant view started to feel more and more superior because obviously if more people are believing that theology, we must be more right. And so we feel superior to those who don't yet get it. And we, they just, we just need to, we need, to, we need to explain it better. We need to study more, maybe argue more. And it started to divide the church right down the middle. It separated them from other people who love Jesus from their heart just like them. They decided that 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 theology was more important. So the smaller group left and opened up a church right across the street. And guess what? Once you start to grow that spirit, that spirit does not die. That church, the smaller church, we're going to get it right. And we're going to now have the right way to teach the end times and the eschatology. And we're going to teach that. And everyone there said, you know, we love Jesus. And we're going to get it right this time. So they started to teach their view of the end times. And after a few years, there was a smaller group out of that that had a different view from the dominant. And they split off and they started their own church. And that happened over and over again until uh, that happened over five times at that split. And maybe we could go, oh, that's fantastic. We've got church growth. We look at all these church plants we're doing. The gospel is growing more and more fantastic. What a, uh, but what it was, what it was, was that was Antichrist. Right. So we have a group known as the separatists. They thought they were superior because of what they knew. And they viewed themselves as being enlightened. So they separated themselves from the simple believers in their minds, they were the elite. They thought they had ascended to some higher level of spiritual knowledge. They had a special revelation. They had a special anointing by God given to only a select few. And they were called the knowers because they knew more than anyone else. Gnostic means simply to know. And what these knowers knew was that the simple belief, these simple believers, these simple Christians that they were a part of in, in church, the problem with these simple Christians is, well, they're simple. And that started to bother them. And so they're stuck there. And, and, and what they didn't know, though, was this. What they didn't know was obedience to God and loving and following God's, loves, God's laws and just loving each other from the heart. And, and because, because, well, that's just not necessary, is what they thought. That, that wasn't very enlightened at all. One group said, I, I know Jesus was good, but he certainly wasn't God because their minds have been so developed and enlightened that they concluded that there's no way that man could be God or God could become a man. I mean, how could a, a man be God? That's absurd. That's dumb. Many groups thought the whole idea that a man would even die for the sins of others and then rise from the dead and that he now lives in men and women and dwelled by the Spirit, well, that's just crazy. That doesn't sound... Uh, now, rule that out. And their perspective towards the simple believers who did believe those things was simply this. Well, how quaint of you that you would believe that about God. But no intelligent, enlightened person like us, no thinking person would ever believe that. And the impact of that theology, especially since it started inside of the church, and then they left others who were still in the church, they left them behind, coming from people who seemed to know leaders in the church, it started to confuse and intimidate everyone who was still in the church. 
These people who seem to know were coming up with a whole new perspective where Jesus is no longer the center of reality, of faith, and the believers who are left, they started to think maybe we really are stupid. Maybe, maybe we don't know. And I don't like feeling stupid. When someone makes me feel stupid, you know what I do? I try to convince them that I'm not stupid. And one way I want to do that is I'll start to agree with people. Oh, you're totally right. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. right. That's totally what I believe too. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, I kind of jump on that bandwagon and, and, and maybe I, I am missing the point. Maybe I, I have missed out on something. Maybe they're the real deal and maybe it's because I, I really am not that smart and I, I know I'm not that smart. And born out of this growing sense of inferiority, you know, they're smart, I'm, I'm dumb. They have it, I don't. These simple believers were just a hair's breadth away from wandering away from their relationship and their devotion to Jesus. Just a second away from taking the candy bar from the guy who says he cares about them, climbing into the car, thinking that they've got what they need and, and, and he doesn't. Now with all of this as the background, that's just the background here. Verse 18, dear children, simple, open-hearted believers in Jesus Christ, let me tell you about the people who are presenting themselves to you as superior to you. Let me tell you about those people who, who, who think that they know everything. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. You Simple believers, you just love Jesus, and you need to know that the reason they left is not because they were ever one of us. Not because there's something wrong with you and that they're somehow superior, which is what you have begun to think, and you need to know that. They left us because, well, there's something wrong with them. John is fighting for his children here. Don't be thinking there's something out there that you're missing. You have everything that you know that you need deep in your heart. You are not the ones who are defective. They are. And some of them, they claim to be enlightened, and some of them say they have a special revelation by God. Verse 20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all that you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth. And I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know because you already know everything. You don't need a teacher for what I'm about to tell you because you already know exactly what I'm about to tell you. And what you know is this, is that Jesus is the sweetest name you know. And you have begun that from day one. That is what you knew from the beginning. That is what you know. You know that you know. And you knew that from day one. Don't let these so-called knowers intimidate you. Don't let them try to convince you that things you don't know. Just because they use big words, maybe they do have a PhD at the end of their name, and they have the inside track that they think they do, it, and, and, and they think that somehow you lack something where they know and you don't. But my friends, my children, my children, you need to know, you need to know your safeguard against all these so-called knowers junk, all that separatist stuff that they say that you don't know, all of the deceivers and the de deniers, the false teachers, these manipulators. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. That's, I, just, I just want that. I just want that. I just want you to remember. Just remember, just remember, just remember. What you knew from the very beginning is a child of God. And if you remember and remain in the thing that you knew from day one when you came to Jesus that very first day, you're going to be protected from all of those deceivers and what it is that you knew from that very first day. And do you remember what you knew from that first day? Do you remember? And, and, and I'm going to tell you what you knew from day one. This is what you knew from the very first day, that Jesus was the sweetest name you knew. John said it this way in, in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which you have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at with our hands, have touched, this is what we proclaim concerning the word of life. And it wasn't some vague philosophy about life. The, the life appeared and we have seen it and testified to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. This life and truth that we have has been made visible. And I'm here to tell everyone that is what I know that I know that I know. And that's what you know. And that's what you knew from the beginning. You knew that from day one, and you didn't need anyone to tell you about that. It's just what you knew. Here's the protection from all the deceivers, all the deniers, all the separators, the knowers that make you feel inferior, 
and make you feel stupid because of what you don't know, you started following after their teaching, hoping maybe you would get their approval, maybe you would get their acceptance, and you, maybe you would feel smart, or at least not feel like a target anymore, and here is your protection. Let this be the one thing you come back to every single morning. It's what you knew from the beginning, that Jesus is the sweetest name that you know. That Jesus is the way, he is the truth and the life. And you knew that from the very first day. You knew that he was the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And you may not have ever used those words or said it that way, but that is exactly what you knew. Dr. S.M. Lockhart, or Lockridge, said it this way of Jesus, and this is just an excerpt that Jesus is unparalleled and unprecedented. He is the centerpiece of civilization. He is the sum of human greatness and the source of divine grace. His name is the only one that is able to save, and his blood is the only one able to cleanse. And he has the key to all knowledge, and he is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. And you knew all of that on your first day. And that's why you came into faith. He's the king of righteousness, and he is the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven, and he's the king of glory. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's enduringly strong and entirely supreme. He's eternally steadfast. He is immortally faithful. He is imperially powerful and impartially merciful. I wish I could more accurately describe him to you, but he's undescribable. Yes, he is incomprehensible. He's invisible. He's irresistible. And you knew that on day one. Are you getting the flow of the text of John from this letter? You have these believers being told they don't know anything. John is saying, you know everything you already need to know. Jesus is the sweetest name that you know. And from that, yes, we can grow forward. But you already know the truth. And if you just embrace and hold on to what you knew from the beginning, that is your safeguard, my children. From every deceiver, every denier, and accuser, and manipulator, and so-called knower, you don't need some fancy teacher. You don't need some special revelation beyond it. Those things are good. They're healthy. They will grow you. But that is not the most important thing because you already know the most important thing, that Jesus is the sweetest name that you know. And from that you will grow. And I have confidence in you that you will grow because if, if, if he is the sweetest name that you know, then you will obey and you're going to start to follow his laws and you're going to walk in different ways and in new ways and in strong, firm-footed ways and you're going to love others from your heart and you're going to invest and pour your life out and you're going to run with courage. Verse 27. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Usually when we think of anointing, we think of protection, or it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. Uh, usually we think of them, uh, it's an empowerment. You may hear a sermon, and then you're like, man, that was a powerful sermon. You go, that was anointed. And I would say that as well. It's a phrase that usually in Christian circles we, we kind of just throw around. And usually it's related to a task when we're doing something that's infused uh, kind of with supernatural kind of a touch from God. And, and when we hear it and we feel the power of God, usually we say, man, I really feel the anointing. And, and, and maybe you see it in someone, you're like, man, I see the anointing. God's hand is on that person. And, and there's a kind of a specialness to it. And it comes on you for a task. And, and it's not... That is not what John's talking about here, though. He's talking about the indwelling spirit, the anointing that every single one of us have all the time. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit on our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And when I was reading the, the things that we already know about Jesus... When I was reading that list, and, and Bill Parks amended it, I love that. 
because it, it, it was telling us something that we already uh, knew. It had been inside us, in, in our spirit, and in mine at least, I felt I, I was like, I know that, I know that. That is what I, tr- I do, I believe that. I believe that is what is true, and I knew that from the beginning. And, and something in you just goes, yes, the Spirit of God is, is moving in me, and that is the truth that will carry you through your life. And that is the truth, and that will take you home one day. There are a lot of false teachers, many people who think they have a a teaching that's new or above others. There are many deceivers, and there are many separators. And sometimes they're obvious, and they're really easy for us to notice so we can walk away. Uh, And and sometimes it's subtle, where maybe they're even pastors in churches, and and, and they're starting other churches or denominations, and, and they draw us away subtly, but we just need to remember what it is that we've always known. When I lived in Alaska, I went to this conference, and there were pastors and, and, and representatives at this conference from all kinds of churches around the Anchorage area, and there were different denominations. There were people, there were Catholics and Lutherans and, and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Methodists and, uh, you know, the, the Baptists and every, I mean, it was, it was uh, Seventh-day Adventists, non-denominational. There were people in the CMA like me. There were Charismatics, and, 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 and it was this wonderful connection to have all these people together, hundreds of us, and the reason we were there was simply this. We wanted to wonder with each other and to have discussion and just talk about how can we impact the Anchorage area for Christ together. And I go, how does that happen? I mean, how do you get all these people from all these kinds of denominations coming to worship together to just wonder together, just to, just to even ask the question, just to wonder how can we impact this area for the kingdom of God? And, and how together could we affect the city for Christ it, it, it happens when we will abide and remain in what we have known from the beginning. Because in that room, what all of us knew in that room together, when we were sitting there worshiping, standing, shaking hands, what every single one of us knew was that Jesus is the sweetest name that we know. And we all knew that. And we differed in many different theological areas, but we didn't care about that. That didn't matter. Because Jesus was the sweetest name that we knew. And we could join each other there. And we could come together. That simple thing. That was the safeguard for us. And that is the safeguard for the little children. And that is the safeguard for simple believers like you and me who just remember we need to remain in what it is that we have heard from the very beginning. And what we have heard from the beginning is that Jesus is the sweetest name that we knew. So as we come, we're going to transition into communion and into back into some worship. I'm just going to pray. Father, initially as I just read this, what I thought was a really complex passage and it was going to be so hard to figure out. You just kept guiding it back and back to such a simple thing. Your name is the sweetest name that we know. And you want to fill us with your life and your light and your joy and your wisdom and your guidance and your peace. So fill us this morning and as we come to the communion table that we would come and just thank you for what you've done to make it available for us to be able to come because you are the sweetest name we knew. So come let us adore you Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy.
let's just let's just sing come let us adore him one more time so come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord and all hail King Jesus and all hail King Jesus and all hail King Jesus
matter the result, let us not be tossed around by the wind and the rain. Let us just remember that you are good. Let us keep you as king of our heart. Let us, let us share that goodness. Let us tell people about it. Father, we just ask you for that today. We just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.